Welcome to Chapter 5. This chapter deals with learning disabilities. Let's start off with talking about the definition of learning disabilities. There's been a lot of controversy over this definition and it continues to be hard to define even to, in today's terms. The term was first used by Samuel Kirk in 1963 at a conference of parents. Um, the parents liked this term. In the past it was called minimal brain dysfunction and a lot of other uh, confusion over is this possibly brain damage. But the idea of learning disabilities wasn't even recognized until 1968. Congress recognized that and included learning disabilities with, as a, a funding source and then it was included under the IDEA Act in 1975. Let's look at the characteristics of learning disabilities and, and there are many. It's actually an information processing problem. It's a difficulty in understanding or using language. A person with a learning disability may have difficulty in the ability to listen, to think, to speak, even to read and write, or do math. This cre creates a great frustration, anxiety, and tension. These are the feelings that a child or an individual with LD has if they do not have the proper accommodations. So how do we diagnose it? Well, we have to rule out many things and those are called the exclusion criteria. We have to rule out problems in vision, they don't have problems with hearing, uh, their learning difficulties are not the result of other disabilities or environmental or cultural disadvantages. Children with learning disabilities have a wide range of, uh, of issues and it, it can include any of one of a thousand of combinations. So we really have to take our time doing a careful and complete evaluation to determine if this indeed is a learning disability. Well, let's take a look at what the law talks about and how we try to determine if it's a learning difficulty. First of all, we look at a, a difference between IQ and achievement. So here the individual has an average or you know, function in the average range of intellectual ability as measured on a standard IQ test, but we're seeing the fact that they are not doing very well despite a, you know, an average or above IQ, they're functioning much lower. So we have to think what is this ca like what's causing this? It's not due to a lack of motivation. It's not due to a lack of being taught. It's not due to other disabilities. It's not due to an intellectual disability. So though again, those are your exclusion criteria. So the defining characteristic for learning disabilities is the fact that there's a specific achievement deficit in the presence of adequate overall intelligence. We need to give them special education. People with a learning disability experience one or more of the following difficulties. They have difficulty reading. Um, that would be called dyslexia. They may have difficulty in written language, in other words, um, coordinating their thoughts from their head into uh, maybe making their pencil move. And so their writing might look very fragmented or they might choose words that are very small because it's extremely difficult to write. They may have underachievement in math. In fact, about half of the people with learning disabilities actually have you know, an IEP in the math area. They may also have significant trouble with social skills, uh, maybe behavioral concerns. If they're frustrated and angry and feeling terrible about their learning um, difficulties, they might even have d um, depression or anxiety. Uh, maybe they are withdrawn. Perhaps they bully other children and so they internalize many feelings regarding this learning difference. They may also have uh, problems with attention. 
And in some cases, they may have ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Now, that's an entirely different disability area, but they may have both, a learning, a learning disability and ADHD. They may have other behavioral problems, um, low self-esteem, and so forth. Again, here is a review on that defining characteristic. Put a star there in your notes to help you remember this. So how prevalent is learning disabilities? Well, um, if you remember from Chapter 1, this is by far the largest of all special education categories. Almost half, well, it's actually 42% of children with disabilities get services under the learning disability category. If you'll note there, 90% of the referrals are for reading. Notice that boys outnumber girls 3 to 1. And the number of children that we are identifying is growing, uh, maybe with advanced knowledge of this, more knowledge out there, and also better testing. And the IDEA law was also amended in 2004 to broaden the criteria and to look at learning disabilities because many children were falling through the cracks. Reading disabilities are uh, again the most common. So what do we know about the cause of learning disabilities? And if you notice on this slide here, I've underlined it, in most cases the cause is simply not known. And, and that is important because, you know, parents do want to know what caused it and we, in this case we don't know. Now we've started to look at brain differences with our more sophisticated brain scanning. We are seeing right now that some children show different activation patterns during reading. There's some differences in the way they are processing information. And sometimes we see neurological and brain structure differences in some individuals. Also, when, you know, looking at the biological perspective, we are seeing some evidence that perhaps genetics may account for some linkage with problems with dyslexia or reading disability. That's relatively new information. We have also tried to pinpoint, it, are there any biochemical imbalances in the brain? And we're really finding that we don't see that right now. We don't see anything like, okay, it's problems with neurotransmitters, you know, something like you would see maybe in a mental health concern like depression. We aren't seeing that in learning disabilities. Is it something in the environment? Well, we don't know, but we, we do think that an impoverished living condition early in a child's life, and if you don't have access to early information, that would contribute to an achievement deficit. Now, this is a big idea. How do you actually help someone with a learning disability? And this is the practical part of the class. What you need to do is give direct, intensive, and systematic instruction. We need to give the supports, maybe, of extended test time, the gift of time. Maybe we need to give, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one help, maybe a pull-out to a resource room if the child needs that, maybe for reading skills and then the rest in, in the regular classroom. But what we want to do is give that help and that feedback for that student. This is a lifelong um, issue. It doesn't usually re remediate, but we would find ways to help you. This is not a medication-based strategy that you can give a pill to help someone with a learning disability. It's really in behavioral interventions. What does explicit instruction mean? Well, that is the, a method of helping. Now, many of you are not going to be teachers, but in your field you'll be surprised at how many times you do need to teach a skill, whether you be a case manager, if you're a nurse educator, in the criminal justice system, if you're working with probation and parole, you're going to have to teach some skill sets to help people um, in, in daily life. 
And by the way, for those of you in criminal justice, the prevalence of learning disabilities in the incarcerated population is very, very high, almost 80%. So this is very useful information. Explicit instruction means taking very small steps. Then check to see, do you understand? And then getting an active response back from that individual. So in other words, demonstrate the skill, prompt the skill, and then practice. I'll show you. Now we'll do it together. Now you do it. Now that is awesome, and I can give you feedback and prompts and cues, guided practice, so you can practice it until you can apply it on your own. Now this is a process. It doesn't happen all at once. It's not self-paced. It's not trial and error or discovery type of learning. Now those are not helpful strategies for a person with a learning disability. Think about it in your life. When did you have someone say, hey, watch me. Now we'll try it together, and now you do it. I'm sure you've had experiences like that already. It's a great way, and I know many of us teach our children that way. Um, so this is a great skill set for you to practice with others. And that positive feedback is very, very important. What other ways can we use to help? Well, explicit instruction also says, let's give examples. Let me show you how to do this. Think about that in school. Did you ever have a teacher show you something and say this is how it is supposed to look? And they give you a sample paper and then they, you're, you're to copy the, those same ideas and formatting and concepts. Or maybe it was a shop class where you were making something and the instructor said this is what you know the birdhouse is going to look like when you finish your project. Here is a model of what we want. Here's an excellent example of what we want you to do. So I'm going to show it to you in a model or I'm going to give you a map, a visual map on how to do it. Many times people with a learning disability are visual learners. So showing a picture of something is extremely important. Now if you have someone that doesn't seem to uh, understand, you can say, hey, show me how you got to that conclusion. You know, tell me how you came to that decision, and then you can help them and guide them through uh, different explanations to get to the goal that they want. Please give positive, frequent feedback. Think about when someone said to you, hey, you're, you know, I appreciate your hard work. Look at you. You're making progress. Sometimes people with a learning disability have such poor self-esteem because they feel that they are slow learners or that they've been a failure that they don't want to try. So giving that positive feedback is extremely important. Giving opportunities for practice. You know, um, we don't learn things all at once usually and so we need time to try things out, you know, make adjustments and then to continue forward. Other ways to help are guided notes. For example, if you printed off the notes for this class while I'm lecturing, you could be taking notes and not have to write everything down. That, that's a great help. Um, visual organizers, you know, maybe having all, you know, like say for math you want a blue folder, for science you're going to have a red folder. Um, those things are helpful. Or concept maps where you're drawing a picture and connecting big ideas together are very helpful. Mnemonics are little ways that we can remember big ideas. Maybe you remembered, you know, the days of the month by, you know, a certain mnemonic or perhaps like in your medical class you learned like the parts of the nervous system by memorizing the first letter of the nerves and making up a word or something like that. So that's a mnemonic and we all use those kinds of things to help us study. How can we help someone with a learning disability? What are our placement options? Well, about a little more than a half of students with a learning disability are educated in the regular classroom. Maybe they have a teacher that helps the regular classroom teacher you know, support the inclusion of that student with a learning disability. So the teacher is getting some additional information on how to help that student. So there's your consultant teacher. Um, and then you might also have a resource room <clears throat> where the student might, 
if, if it's indicated, leave the, the classroom and go to a specially equipped classroom where they get individualized instruction. If you remember <clears throat> in Chapter 2, you had that pyramidal range of services chart, and a resource room is about halfway up that pyramid. It's, it is a more restrictive setting. You might also use a separate classroom if needed. The student may not be um, included in the regular classroom if, if there's too much uh, distraction, if they need well, more, much more one-to-one -one instruction. Maybe they would not learn best in the um, you know, more inclusive classroom. So it really, again, depends on the student's needs. <clears throat>